the bus station is on Los Angeles Street, and right next to the bus station, as we came out, next block was Main Street. We wound up on Main Street, and we took a look. We saw this looks like Skid Row. So we, we're there, um, and we're looking for a place to live. Um, as we walk up and down the street, we see this hotel. It was the um, uh, Roslyn Hotel. Uh, we went there and asked them how much they charge. It turned out to be a dollar a night. That was the right price for us, and we decided to rent. And we rented one room. Uh, it was a dollar for, for each one of us and um, we stay there a while and we are looking for a job. We put in ads in the paper, we check every paper, we can't find a job. No upholstery job, no, I would do anything. It didn't matter, just work. We couldn't find anything. After we ran out of money, we had to barter all of our clothing and valuables. We had a wristwatch and whatever we had for the money, but we needed the money for the rent and we ran out of it. So we had no more rent money. Uh, we went to the owner and the owner said to us, okay, I understand your problem. I know you're looking for a job and I believe that once you get your job, you will pay me back. So we stayed there actually rent-free for a while. Um, and meanwhile, we ran out of money to buy food. Um, I remember next to the Roslyn, right near the Roslyn Hotel, there was a cafeteria called Clifton's Cafeteria. And we would go in, either I or my friend, I Jack, um, and we would fill our pockets with food, and then we would buy a cup of coffee and pay for the coffee. And this is, I went there one day and filled my pockets so that my friend can eat when I came out. The next day he would go there, and buy a cup of coffee, and fill his pockets, and this is how we lived. It was. One Friday evening, and we were both very depressed. We can't get a job. We ran out of money. We hugged all of our clothing, and all I, we had between us was 30 cents between the two of us. Um, so I said to Martin, to, I said to Jack, you know, I feel so much like praying. Uh, we got away from the religion, and here we are in Los Angeles, all separate from everybody else, and in bad position, we can't get a job. Um, I really feel like praying. So there must be a Jewish community someplace in Los Angeles I know the family and everyone told us there are no Jews in Los Angeles. I couldn't believe that. So we found out that in Boyle Heights, there are a lot of Jewish people live there. And it was Friday evening, and usually for Sabbath we pray for starting Friday. Um, so we decided uh, after we found out that in Boyle Heights are Jewish people, we took the uh, trolley car to go to Boyle Heights, but it was 20 cents a ticket, and we only had 30 cents between us. So when the conduct conductor came over, I told him our sob story, our story. I said, this, this is all we have, and we have to get there um, or else we were on the street. He felt sorry for us, and he only collected 20 cents, so we were left with a dime. 
and now we're on our way to Boyle Heights. And after a while, we see a man uh, with a black hat and two boys next to him, and he's holding a pouch under his arm, and I can tell it contains a talit, which is a uh, prayer shawl, a prayer shawl. So I, so we started to yell to the trolley car driver, please let us out, let us out. And he was glad to get rid of us, I guess. So, okay, he stopped right there in the middle and he let us out and we walk up to this man, introduce ourselves, and I asked him, where are you going? Are you going to services? Oh yeah, I'm going to uh, Rabbi Tarsha's temple. We walk up to the rabbi, introduce ourselves. Now the rabbi was surprised to see two teenagers come in. He was very happy to see us because all the parishioners in those days were all older people. The younger people went to better locations in, in Los Angeles. We didn't know that. We were so glad to see a, a Jewish place, a place of worship, and we went in, and my friend Jack, he was like a rabbi. You see, we were both the same age, but he comes from Hungary, and Hungary was not occupied until 1944. I come from Poland, and Poland was occupied in 1939. So you have these five years that he had additional um, schooling while I was on the run and hiding, and uh, my schooling stopped at age 10 and a half, you know. So um, he was educated in, in religious thing, becomes for him a very highly religious family, and he was ordained as a rabbi. So he asked the, the rabbi there, after we introduced ourselves, whether or not he can lead the services. The rabbi was a little surprised, really, teenagers. And uh, he was happy to hear that. Uh, he says that, you know, I have smicha, I have, I was ordained, uh, I, I, I know what I'm doing. And he allowed us, he allowed him, I helped him, but he allowed Jack to get on the stage and lead the services. Well, the minute he opened his mouth, I didn't recognize Jack. His whole face, his whole demeanor changed on him. And he got so engrossed and involved in prayers that you couldn't recognize him. And his voice was great. He had such a beautiful voice. And, you know, in, in Hebrew or in, in the Jewish religion, there is such a word that's called kavana. Kavana is where your whole mind, body and soul are engulfed in prayer. The whole congregation was going along with him. Jack was like another man from another world. I didn't even recognize him. Beautiful voice and everybody went along with him. Um, and when he finished, everyone came in and they lifted them up and they were dancing with him. Uh, they were so shocked to see a teenager lead a service with so much feeling. He asked the rabbi if he could lead the service tomorrow morning. Now, and meanwhile, they heard where we're living 
and says, oh no, you can't live there anymore. This is ridiculous. We'll find a place. They went to Mrs. Greenberg and she had an extra room and like a board, we became boarders at Mrs. Greenberg. That night we slept there. And uh, anyway, the next day, the rabbi was surprised to hear, you wanna pray the next, lead the service the next day? And he said, yes, that's the morning service. And the following day on Sabbath, uh, we both left and we're going to the temple. Now on our way, as we came close to the temple, we see a crowd of people and usually a crowd of people meant trouble from, from Europe. But no, these people had a smile on their faces and they came over and they, they were welcoming us, come on in, and, and they had a lot of people come to prayers. Apparently word got out that this young man who is a cantor or he is a rabbi and a cantor, he was out of this world, you have to come listen to him. So the place was packed, was packed. And after the services, they just lifted him up and they danced with him. They just couldn't believe what was going on. So anyway, after the evening service, um, we went, of course, the rabbi had a, um, a, a reception there with food and everything we ate there. And right after, during this, the uh, meal, we were informed that the, um, the um, temple uh, management or whoever is in charge uh, they would like to talk to us. Uh, you, after dinner, we would come into this room. So we came into the room and they made an offer for Jack to play, to, to uh, lead the services for the high holidays. The high holidays were only like four weeks or five weeks away. So of course, um, and they offered them $350 if he would do that. And that is for Rosh Hashanah, which is New Year's, the Jewish New Year. And then Yom Kippur, eight days later, there is uh, the high holidays of Yom Kippur. And he would lead through those holidays. And they offered 350 then I became the business manager and I uh, gave them a counter offer for five, $500 and we need half of it right away because we have to pay off our debts. So, okay, they agreed uh, to give us $500 and Sunday morning we went down there and they gave us $250. We went to the hotel. We paid off the hotel and we said goodbye and we thanked them. Then I, I went to um, Clifton Cafeteria and I wanted to see the manager. I called out for the manager. They called the manager and then went into the office, the manager, and I tell them the story, what we have done and I feel very bad about it, um, and I offered them $25 to take care of whatever we did take from you. He started to laugh, and he says, Mr. Lesser, we knew all about what you were doing all along. We watched you, and we knew what you were doing, but we figured you didn't look like the average bum in the neighborhood. So what we did, we followed you. We even know that you slept and you lived at the Rosalind Hotel. And uh, they went to the Rosalind Hotel manager and they told him the story. 
And then they all knew about it. We didn't know. The, man, the manager, I told them, you know, they're looking for a job and they're, they're not just street bumps. They're really looking for a job. And so anyway, he wouldn't, this is what he tells me. He knew all about it, but I figured we'll give you a break. He wouldn't take the money. Um, he would just thank me for doing this, or coming there. And um, they had it all on film. They had everything on film. They knew exactly what was going on. They followed us, never approached us. So I was very thankful. But anyway, now Jack receives an offer for a job. And one of the parishioners had a sheet metal company. So he gave them a job, but I was left without a job. And um, one day we get a call and they asked for Jack, the upholsterer. And Jack was already working, of course, in a sheet metal working. Um, I said I was Jack, the upholsterer. He says, they need me for tomorrow morning. Um, I says, I'll be there at 8 a.m. And Jack came home, I told him the story. So Jack says, how are you going to, you don't know anything about it. So he took a, a apple box and you know, in those days they didn't have staplers. So they had a hammer, one end of the hammer was magnetic. So we used to do what they call spit nails. They would fill your mouth, you would fill your mouth with tacks. And with your tongue, you would turn the tack such a way that the head is by the lips. And then you would take the magnetic hammer and uh, pull it out and um, pound it into the upholstery. But you had to be real fast and you had to pound it on a straight line. So, um, he took a box, an apple box, and he showed me how to work with the tags, with the nails. So all night long we were up and I was practicing. Next morning my lips were all swollen and bloody, um, but I learned how to do it and I learned how to do it pretty fast. Next morning I went there, introduced myself as uh, Jack Cohn. The owner was very happy to meet me. And he says, why don't you go over to the secretary and fill out all the papers with her, um, and then we'll show you what to do. So I did go over there, and while I went there, I, I told her my real name, Ben Lesser. I figured he won't remember the name. Um, as long as he has an upholsterer, he probably doesn't remember the names. So I took a chance, and sure enough, she filled out the papers as Ben Lesser, and I had the job now as an poster job, and he showed me what to do. The name of the company was Acme Chrome Company. They were making mostly uh, seats and bags for dinette sets. In those days, they had these plastic, uh, covered dinette sets with a seat and, and a back. And it was very simple. Um, so I started to work on it and I can do it very well. Um, and after a while I went to the boss, I realized I can do it even better and faster. So I went over to him and I asked him if he would mind arranging something on piecework. Um, and he uh, agreed uh, at the price so much per piece, so much for a back and so much for a seat. And I started the whole production line myself. I, I had the seamstress sew the seats together in the backs and I put the cotton on each item and I, I did it in very fast. And before we knew it, I was making more money than the manager who was there 30 years already. 
Um, but the, the owner came over to me and says, Ben, you don't tell anyone how much you're earning <laughs> because I'll get in trouble. So don't. And this is the agreement we had. But he didn't care because I put out the mer merchandise. He needed it fast, and I was fast. I had an assembly line going. One evening after services, we came back home to Mrs. Greenberg's. We were surprised she had company. She had a Mr. and Mrs. Singer. They also had their daughter, Jean. I sat next to Jean, and Jack, who was a great conversationalist, he kept the company um, busy with, with his stories. We were sitting next to each other, and we, were st we started to talk to each other separately. Um, and before we knew it, after dinner, we wound up on the couch talking to each other. Um, and somehow we made a date. And I don't remember who initiated that, but we did make a date. We took the bus and we went to a theater. Um, and then we went out for dinner. And we had the nerve, at least I had the nerve, with $20 in my pocket to invite Jean to go out and we went to the Coconut Grove. That's the most expensive place you could go to. Um, uh, it was a Friday night uh, for drinks and just dances and entertainment. And there was a uh, service charge of at least two drinks and we each ordered two martinis that's the only drink we ever heard about, a martini, and we didn't even know what it tastes like. So all evening long, we just um, held these two martinis, and we zipped on it every once in a while, and we had a good time drinking and dancing. Um, but afterwards, um, I guess neither one of us really had the nerve to order food because we had no idea what the price is and I wouldn't take a chance. And Jean was smart enough not to order either. And uh, so um, we had a good time and then we left. And then going home, we stopped at the deli. Um, in our neighborhood in the Delhi, and we had a good meal together. And then it was a nice date. I, mean, I took her home, and of course, um, we kissed. We kissed, and uh, it was hard for me to leave. But eventually, of course, I had to leave, and we made um, we just said goodbye. And meanwhile, a friend of mine from Germany came out to the United States, a young lady with his mother. And um, so I came out to New York to meet them and see if we can find a place for them and set them up and all that. Um, but there was nothing between me and her daughter. Um, we're just friends. Um, after, so I, I was in New York, and while I was there about a month or two, maybe two months, um, Jean must have been wondering what happened to me. And I didn't call her. For some reason, I don't know, I felt maybe Maybe she can do better with an American young man than uh, this greenhorn. <laughs> you know, who am I at this point, you know? So um, she uh, waited for me. And uh, when I did come back to Los Angeles, I decided to call her. And I found out she was waiting for me. 
and we went out again. In fact, uh, this time we went to the RKO Theater down in Los Angeles, downtown LA, and uh, we saw a movie, Golden Earrings. We'll never forget this because this is now our song. There's a song called Golden Earrings. Um, and wherever we went to a dance or to a wedding, they always played it for us and we always danced to it. So we became very close. Okay, it's our third date, Gene and I, mine, and we go to MacArthur Park. In the park, we rented the boat and we went out on the boat ride. And I don't know what happened, but I proposed to her. <laughs> 